the TV is leaking! Dead by Daylight is a game full of weird and complicated terms, that for someone who knows very little about the game, hearing Nicolas Cage just spun the xenomorph would sound like a fever dream. Of all the weirdness though, one thing does remain consistent, and that is the player base's feelings for certain characters. On one end we got the most beloved cast of characters that no one could hate, and on the other, characters who have been placed on the gallows for the community to publicly execute. In a sense, every character in the game seems to have some kind of view from players. Well, except for one. Yoichi Azakawa is one of the weirdest characters in the game, because it genuinely feels like no one remembers he exists. And I feel bad because his development as a character was intriguing. During Behavior's adventure to claim the Ringu license, they were able to get Sadako, however had a much tougher time trying to find a survivor. This could be because of trouble with obtaining licensing for the actors' faces of the Azakawa family, which is fair, no sane person wants to see themselves torn apart, but this was more so a theory the community agreed to, so there could have been other reasons. Luckily, from a spark of genius, or one of the developers were watching Monsters Inc. too many times that day, they decided, like Water News, to take the child. the child! With some age manipulation and taking the raincoat from Little Nightmares, Yoichi was born. All jokes aside, it was very clear they did their homework on making Yoichi. His design and lore puts him near the ocean and near the field of science, just like his father and Sadako. His lore too feels like a careful and enjoyable exploration of the Ringu story most fell in love with. Yoichi is also Behavior's second attempt at a hybrid character. However, unlike Ghostface who was very generously given content, Yoichi has been left to rot. Now this obviously has to do with licensing, as Yoichi is still a part of the Ringu franchise, but I still can't help but feel bad that he's struggled to receive anything outside of a Christmas sweater. He is now starting to get a new outfit after two long years of waiting, and as the three people who main Yoichi would say, we take what we can get. As for Yoichi's perks, this is where things get more interesting, as his perks were heavily discussed when they first entered the PTB stage, only to fall out of the community's memory later on. Until today, that is. Look, I know that some people in the comments will claim they absolutely made these perks, some of you may even be in the double digits, however, if you watched my video on Zarina's perks, you will understand the rules for this series. To give a brief summary, if two perks for a character have a 2% or lower pick rate and one with a 4% or lower, they are placed in this series, and all three of Yoichi's perks struggle to break past even 1%. So I'm sorry to the four people who love these perks, I am with you, but the player base are quite happy with their 4 perk diet. Let's first start with something simple and then work up from there. Why are you running? Why are you running? I am going to be honest, this perk absolutely annoyed me. Now, this is not because of the effect, in fact I actually like this one, instead it's because of its name. I have no idea why, but in my past videos for the last year, I have been calling it empathic knowledge. I do not know if my mind finally snapped that day, if Michaela is just messing with me and changed the name, or if I just read the name wrong. Regardless, it has been haunting me and I am still mad about it. I'm more surprised none of you pointed that out, but then again, who even remembers this perk? As for what Empathic Connection does, it allows injured survivors to see your aura if they are within 96 meters of your location, and you have a 10% healing speed boost to other survivors. When I said we were starting off simple, I really meant we were starting simple, as all three of Yoichi's perks are very clear in what they want to do. Empathic, however, is so clear in what it does that all three of its flaws are actually revealed at the same time. How nice of it to do most of the work for me. The first problem we should talk about is its design. More specifically, how it has been designed to be a support perk. You may remember this term, as I used it in the pig video I did a few months ago. And to give a brief summary, support perks are designed to be weak when alone, however are great at enabling other perks and what they need to do. Empathic Connection is great at supporting healing builds as it tells the survivor to run towards you to get healed. This pairs up nicely with perks such as Autodidact and even Metal and Man, as it helps your teammates direct themselves towards you. Granted, the players need to know you are running these perks, but this still can be useful in Swift's with limited communication. Now, there is nothing inherently wrong with support perks. In fact, I personally think they are fantastic additions to the game. However, support perks should have the chance to do well, even if you are running the perk alone. A great example of a modern day support perk is Buckle Up, which I previously talked about in my last video. 
The perk belongs to Ash Williams, and has the simple effect of granting a 10 second endurance effect after healing a survivor from the dying state. This applies to both you and the teammate, and the killer's aura is revealed for 10 seconds as well. The perk, as I said in that video, is comboed greatly with For the People, as both perks solve each other's problems. And Buckle Up also does quite well with other anti-slugging perks, like We're Gonna Live Forever. The perk, however, still has the chance to get value even when run alone, whether to show where the killer is for the healing survivor to run away, or to give a few seconds of safety after being picked up. Empathic Connection sadly does not share in this belief. The 10% healing speed realistically is only saving you 0.8 seconds on a 16 second heal, and there are better alternatives for healing speeds. Even Bonnie Knowledge, a perk that came out when the game launched, gives a 50% heal speed boost. Granted, it used to be 33% for a while, but how is a perk that has been in the game since day one outperform a modern day healing themed perk? Come on, Empathic. I know you can do better. Take a page from Circle of Healing's book. That thing caused the healing economy to crash in its prime. Now, many of you might be saying, well, the healing is not the main focus. That is just something extra. Instead, it is the information it provides, which is where all of its value is placed. I would agree with you on that, but there is a minor issue. One tiny problem that is in the text of what the perk does. Let's look at it together real quick. Whenever another survivor is injured, they see your aura within a range of 96 meters. This is the second problem with the perk. It places all of its value in the hands of your teammates. Now to be fair, in about 60% of situations, this is okay. As I said before, it helps Swifts with limited communications, and in the rare case where you are in solo queue and a teammate needs a heal, Empathic Connection is a blessing in disguise. The other 40% of the time, though, is the solo queue games where your teammates collected by queue is so low they can't even make a bowl of cereal. There are also the situations that you are running away from the teammate who wants to get healed, and this may be rare, but it can happen and it feels awful, especially since you're running a perk that's supposed to support altruism. As for the final problem with the perk, there is no real reward for running to the player running Empathic Connection. Outside of just getting healed 0.8 seconds faster, there really is nothing else that is given for all the trouble for running to the Empathic Connection teammate. You could have used the medkit you brought with you to heal, or you could have gotten healed by the other two teammates who were closer. DBD has already experimented with several perks that reward the players after getting healed, from something small as healing yourself from getting unhooked by Renewal, or Second Wind or whatever behavior want to call it these days, to the more interesting teamwork perks. In comparison, the only reward Empathic can provide is supporting the perks you brought with you. But as I said, for the teammate, they have to gamble on you being an autodidact player who is attempting to build stacks, or you are just an adept Yoichi. Let's now, like healing speeds, add up the faults and see how fast this causes Empathic Connection to fall. The perk's design as a support perk is not too troubling, but the healing speed holds it back from being a reliable alternative. Its focus on giving the teammates all of the value is not the best choice when the solo queue player's collective IQ adds up to 2, and there is no real rewards the perk can provide outside of just giving a 0.8 second faster heal. Now, however, before we get into buff options for the perk, there is one buff that I believe behavior should add to the perk, and it's just a small number tweak. I believe the perk healing speed should be bumped up from 10 to 25%. The 0.8 seconds it saves is just way too low for the perk to be a reliable alternative, especially when other healing perks in the game can go to extremes such as 100%. As for why I chose 25%, while it increases that healing speed from 0.8 seconds to 2, and for a passive perk that is just giving value like Empathic, I felt it was the most comfortable place to keep it from turning into Bonnie Knowledge too. Now onto the more interesting changes, the first buff idea is to help with the second problem with the perk, giving the player with Empathic more control on the perk's value. Along with its current effect, if you are injured you see your all teammates auras within the 96 meter range. This still keeps the perk's identity of giving your teammates value, but now helps elevate its power in solo queue, as now players who run the perk have teammates they can run to for a heal. Along with this, if both players are injured, it helps to support the already existing build paths with Empathic, such as Autodidact. The second buff idea is a tad bit more interesting, as it takes a page from Buckle Up and gives the perk a reward for getting healed by the Empathic player. Along with its current effect, both you and the healed teammate see the killer's aura for 10 seconds. 
Granted, it is taking a lot from Buckle Up's book, but for taking something, let it be the good stuff. Here is a healing build that I found enjoyment from and has seen some success, and this is a build played by Aaron, who was testing the perk out. Empathic Connection is honestly a weird perk. It is clear behavior we're trying to not go too extra with its healing speed boost, especially since it was released during Circle of Healing's Prime, but it genuinely feels like the perk could have been great if behavior were more daring with it. Of the two buffs, any would be good, but the healing speed buff is necessary to help the perk see play by itself. On to the next perk now, which is a little more... interesting. I was scared, I ran away, sue me. And then sue me for this! Smoke bomb! This perk used to be talked about a lot when it was first announced, with many fearing it was way too strong. Behavior were quick to the draw with how scary it could be and they ended up nerfing its numbers, but we are getting way too ahead of ourselves. Parental Guidance's effect is simple. After stunning the killer through any means, your grunts of pain, scratch marks, and pools of blood are suppressed for 7 seconds. Now I know what you are thinking, and yes, when it says any stun, it literally means any stun. So the perk triggers from Blast Mine, Decisive Strike, Head On, and of course, the normal pallet stun and flashlight saves. Now this perk, as I said, was feared by many when it was first announced, as its duration used to be 10 seconds, and this is where we need to talk about stealth. Normally, I tend to mention problems with the perks and why it struggles to support the playstyle it is going for, but stealth is a very... touchy subject in DBD, and we need to discuss why that is the case. Let me paint you a picture. Dead by Daylight. 2016. Stealth used to be the kingpin of playstyles for Survivor, since there were fewer perks, fewer killers, and players were even worse than they are today. It is because of all these things that players utilized stealth much more compared to looping, even when the loops in DBD were much more abusive. As time passed though, everything began to change. As more perks came, chase-themed perks were more popular, more killers came in that had built-in tracking, and killers obtained new information perks too. The players also got better at the game, surprisingly, viewing stealth as a new player playstyle and realizing that if you wanted to get anything done, looping and chase interaction were the way to go. This is the first problem with parental guidance, as it is a perk that removes the engagement between the survivor and killer, as now the killer loses information on you. This is not so much a problem for the players who do enjoy stealth, as a perk that is able to provide them a safety net is great, but for the average player who enjoys 1v1ing a cow shed, this perk only interferes with that enjoyment. Now that I have gotten that out of the way, let us get back to the problems Parental has with stealth. The second problem with the perk is the specifics necessary to obtain its full value. To explain what I mean, we need to look at each detail of the perk. It hides grunts of pain, scratch marks, and pools of blood. This means on indoor maps, this perk can be a menace to face. Same if the map has a lot of tiles to hide behind. But what if we were on a map with very few tiles? Well, this problem can be solved by bringing map offerings. But what about the killers now? Half the killer roster have some way of ignoring pallet stuns, and the other half can ignore the stun through taking one step back. The same problem exists with Smash It, an exhaustion perk that grants a 150% boost to move speed after pallet stunning the killer. Then there are the other perks that can combo with Parental, and they tend to be very weird, where they either share the same issues with specifics, such as combining Parental with Head On, or they introduce new problems, such as Decisive Strike with their 3 second stun against the killer, who can catch up fast enough to ignore both perks. It is because of how specific each piece of the plan needs to fall, that the perk ends up struggling, as if one thing goes wrong, the perk has the chance to backfire. The final problem with the perk is not a big issue, however I personally find that it can lead to many perks failing in popularity. The problem is there is very little indication that the perk did anything. The only way to know that the perk triggered is by looking at the perk in the corner, as it does show a timer of its duration. This can be a challenge however because of the frantic nature of DBD, leading players into suspecting they did not get any value from the perk. This problem may just be a nitpick, but I realistically could not think of any other issues gameplay-wise, as the perk is overall pretty good. It is just the player base not being a big fan of stealth, and with so many perks providing aura reads and revealing locations, this makes it even tougher to utilize. 
So to quickly recap, the perk supports a playstyle that has not aged well in the game. It needs a lot of events to fall into place to receive its full value, and the perk doesn't give a clear indication that it is working. I have two ideas for the perk to buff it up, but this is something we need to be careful about. Stealth can be a very nuclear playstyle in the game, and many tend to dislike it, so buffing any stealth perks need to be watched carefully in case it causes problems. As for parental, I personally think it is fine and doesn't need any changes, and it is similar to for the people, needing a combo piece to make it truly great. But I know saying the perk does not need changes is not good enough for an answer for most, so let's get to the changes already. The first buff is actually a revert. I think Behavior could get away with buffing the numbers back to 10 seconds. This was a problem that many shared back during the PTB when Yoichi and Sadako came out to the game. However, I find that enough time has passed that we have seen that 7 seconds is not enough to achieve all of its value. Maybe 10 seconds would be too much, but these buffs are always hypothetical. A what-if scenario where Michaela broke into Behavior's offices to buff or nerf a perk just for the funny. The second buff is actually targeted at that pesky third problem, and that is to give the perk some kind of cue that it worked. It could be minor, such as a sound trigger, or something much larger, such as an aura read on the killer when you stun them. Either would be good, but with how easily players could manipulate their movement to hide from a killer they can see, it might be too much, so a sound cue would be much better. This is a build that many players who utilize parental guidance use, and this is pretty much all you are getting, as different builds for parental guidance are just swapping one of the perks out for its other accessories. Overall, parental guidance is a decent perk, one that I think is just slept on by the community. Realistically, I think it just needs a new perk to combo with to see more play, similar to for the people. But as for what it could be, I have no clue. At least the perk doesn't have as many issues as the last perk. I got held up a bit back there in the forest because I stopped to pick some mushrooms. See? I like picking flowers too. Look, aren't they beautiful? You would not believe how divisive this perk was back when it first came out. It was one of the very few times that Behavior launched some type of haste modifier outside of exhaustion, and many players were split into two groups on how they felt about the perk. On one side, many claimed it was going to be a meta-shaking perk that would ruin the killer side's enjoyment. On the other, they viewed the perk as interesting, but not strong enough to be meta-defining. Before I share my opinion on the matter, let's first talk about what the perk does. It's a boon totem with all the associated effects. 24 meter range, 14 seconds setup speed, and its effect is that everyone within the to totem's range gain a 2% haste. This effect also lingers for 4 seconds after leaving the range. I personally agreed that the perk was fine, however this was because of how behavior were very strict with the balance on Boon Dark theory. They realized how scary slight adjustments like haste could change the game, and it is because of this that the perk has remained the way it has for so long. After all, what kind of nightmare would be living in if haste modifiers were the meta, right? Oh. I suppose we need to talk about that elephant in the room. When Made For This came to the game, there were many claiming the perk was not going to be meta. In fact, they used Boon Dark Theory as an example to support their beliefs. Because if Dark Theory wasn't meta, clearly Made For This couldn't be, right? Well, this is where we introduce the first problem with Dark Theory, that being its restrictions. The perk has so many restrictions, it's gotten to the point it's rather comedic. To properly use Boon Dark Theory, you must find a totem, spend 14 seconds to bless the totem, make sure it is placed where the survivors and killers will often go, hope the killer doesn't snuff the totem, and if they do, we get to do the whole song and dance again. This is about 4 restrictions for a perk that increases survivor speed by 2%, and this list can grow depending on players breaking totems, shattered hope, or anything else. But these four are the most common. What are the restrictions for made for this? Be injured and not exhausted. Oh, okay, so the boon totem has to practically make a souffle, but made for this in comparison just needs to make a BLT, but it didn't add the lettuce or tomato because it got lazy. This is why I personally dislike made for this and find it too powerful, because it is just too easy to trigger. Well now. During the recording of the script, Behavior finally woke up and changed Made For This to only work on Deep Wound. 
This ends up changing the perk to be an anti-tunnel perk, as it combos well with Dead Heart and Off the Record. Will it change how popular it is? Possibly, but now it is a much more healthier option. So thank you, Behavior. You managed to solve a problem, and it only took you wasting about 10 seconds of my life to do so. Great work. Back to Dark Theory, though, we need to talk about the next problem, which is its possible build paths, which are... troubled. There are realistically two builds that exist for Dark Theory to be a part of, Haste Boosting and Super Boons. We will only briefly touch on Haste Boosting, as it has already found better alternatives with Made For This and Hope, that Dark Theory realistically feels like throwing a pebble at a boulder. It makes a cool sound, but it's rather pointless. Now for Super Boons, this is where you attach all four Boon Totems into your kit to gain as much value from Boons as possible. Realistically, the idea is cool, as the Boon Totem radius now has multiple effects to solve several issues. However, just as it shares the same radius, it also shares the same problems and restrictions that Dark Theory has. Then there are the Blessing or Cleansing Totem perks, but those tend to be very niche and only provide possible benefits for setting up the totems. If you are curious on which ones are good though, Overzealous is great especially after its buff, Clairvoyance is a niche perk but okay, and stay away from Calm Spirit, as Behavior hate this perk and we should too, as it could have been great but instead disappoints once more. The final problem of Boon Dark Theory is one that exists with the Boon Totem's range, as 24 meters is very small. Due to the effects of Dark Theory, you want to place the totem in the location where the survivor and killer will often go in the match. Main buildings and Killer Shack are great examples of totem locations for Dark Theory, however this value is gambling on the totems being close enough to these locations. With the RNG of totem spawns, along with a small totem range, this makes Dark Theory struggle in giving value, even with the Linger effect. Interestingly, this wasn't a problem back when Boons initially came out. It used to be 32 meters, giving the Boons more wiggle room to play with. Why did it get nerfed? Because Circle of Healing decided it would be funny to heal survivors faster than killers could wipe their weapons, and this led to all future boons getting gutted. Granted, it was a healing problem in the game, and Circle of Healing was not a balanced perk, but I am still a little ticked off that it took behavior so long to fix the perk, when the community knew the problem since day one. I bet you find this very funny, don't you, Michaela? Oh now, where did she go? Oh right, I forgot, there was that stupid witching hour convention she's going to. Hopefully nothing bad happens. Back to the task at hand, Boon Dark Theory is a perk that has too many restrictions for its reward, the build paths struggle as much as Dark Theory to get maximum value, and Michaela's Halloween treat ended up being a trick for Boon Totem Balance. Now on to buffing this perk, and this is where things get tough. As I said, haste boosting can be a very deadly game to play with and the same can be said about totem balancing for boons, as attempting to buff one boon totem will end up breaking another. It is because of these problems that we need to go a more additive direction with balance for Dark Theory, specifically giving new tools with Dark Theory's current effect. The first buff isn't actually my own idea. Instead, it was a joint concept with a viewer in Scott Jones Twitch chat, so if they watch this video, thank you for the fun talk and for a great idea. The concept pretty much is to buff Boon Totems so they all have secondary effects. So along with their regular effect, they would have a secondary effect that supports running multiple Boon Totems. A good example of this is one Boon Totem reduces the setup time by 25%, another increases the range, and so on. This helps the Super Boon build as its synergy is already low, but with this idea the reason to run different Boons to support others is great. As for what Dark Theory should have, I am personally attached to giving it the additional effect to increase Boon Totem Linger Duration effects by 4 additional seconds. This helps it combo with Boon Shadow Step, the only boon that actually combos well with Dark Theory, and it raises the idea of supporting other lingering totem effects in the future. The second buff idea is one I suspect many will love, as it returns a playstyle that many players miss. The second buff idea is one I suspect many will love, as it returns a playstyle that many Survivor players miss. Along with its current effect, Dark Theory now increases vaulting speeds by 3%. Do I even need to talk about why this is a good buff for the perk? It helps support the perk's identity as a chase enabler, and it gives YouTubers more content on Vault Speed 2.0. I'm sure many DBD YouTubers would enjoy this buff after what was taken away from Spine Chill a year ago. 
On to the possible builds. As I said, here's the Super Boon build I was talking about. And here's a build I have enjoyed using for a while, but it can be swapped around for other perks. If I had to describe Yoichi's perks in one word, it would be... safe. Behavior definitely were afraid of what happened with Circle of Healing, and with how players were complaining about the other perks that came up with the following chapter, they decided to be more careful, especially since these perks had the chance to cause more chaos. It is a shame that players have forgotten Yoichi Azakawa and these perks, but I am hopeful that the curse he is under lifts much sooner than later. Hello everyone, Michaela here, and I hate to inform you that I will be unavailable to torment Silenced Hero as I am busy at the Witching Hour convention. It is very fun here, as we get to learn new incantations for making soap and new means to torment our enemies. I have to go now, as we are preparing the opening sacrifice, and it is a very special guest. I think I took a wrong turn somewhere. Hello everyone. Thank you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, please consider doing all the YouTube things, as it does help the channel. If you liked watching this type of content, I have other videos a part of the Why No One Uses series you can watch, and the new series, The Bizarre Case, is the same structure, but just for perks that don't meet the requirements for Why No One Uses. I really wanted to upload this video during Halloween, but because I got busy, and most importantly because I got lazy, the video ended up getting delayed multiple times. I'll try better to be faster on uploading, but don't take that as a promise. I'm also planning on bringing back polls soon for the next up video, so enjoy looking for that. As for why I haven't posted a new poll in a while, it is because I was busy rewriting the rules, and wanted some videos to help show off the updated rules before going back to what I did before. This is all I really have to say, so have fun everyone, and good luck in your games. You will need it for this upcoming chapter. Especially... for that creature.